This is the second video in the Materials and Inventories module. And in this video, we're going to work with an example Simeo model of a supply chain. So this is our first model, our first complete model that we'll do uh, using the inventory element. So we have a very simple supply chain here. We have a single product, and uh, product one is comprised of two components. Component A, and we need two units of component A for each unit of the product. Uh, and component B, where we only need one unit. The product is assembled at a factory and is sold at the store. Uh, supplier A supplies the raw material component A, and supplier B uh, supplies the uh, raw material component B. So if we look at this structure, we need the inventories as follows. So we have a product one inventory that's at the store. So customers come in, buy a unit of the product, one or more units of the product, uh, and those uh, uh, items are pulled from that uh, store inventory. We also have an inventory of the product at the factory, and the factory replenishes the supply to the store. When the product one inventory go, uh, uh, reaches a, um, uh, a point defined by our replenishment policy, we're going to uh, use component A and component, component B to assemble more products. So this is an assembly operation rather than a replenishment from supplier operation. And then we will replenish component A from uh, supplier A, and we will replenish component B from uh, supplier B. And so you can see we have uh, three different materials. We have product one, which is specified as a bill of materials, and then we have component A and component B. So I'm going to start modeling with a, a what I'm calling a starting model here. And so I've already put a couple of components down and uh, I'm going to go through this model uh, and I want you to stop the video and, and recreate, make sure that you can recreate this model. I'm not going to provide the model, but I'll give you enough details so that you should be able to, um, uh, to build it before we get started with the replenishment process. So basically what we have in our starting model is we have the materials defined and the consumption processes, but we don't have any of the replenishment policy yet. So uh, describing our model, let's uh, take a quick look at our uh, material and uh, inventory elements. So you can see here's our product one and it is defined by this bill of materials. So let me slide this over here. So we have, uh, it requires two component A and one component B for each unit of product one. And then of course we have component A and component B and all three of these inventory, all three of these material elements are location-based inventory. So remember that we can have replenishment of the inventory element, but in, for this model, we wanna have separate inventories. And so the inventories that we mentioned before, we have product one at the store, we have product one at the factory, uh, we have component uh, A and B at the factory, uh, component A at supplier A, component B at supplier B. And so recall with an inventory element, unlike the material element, the inventory is directly connected to what's called a site object. So the inventories associated with the store, we will associate with the purchase object, the purchase server in this case. For the component or the, the materials associated with uh, the factory, we will have for assemble. So we're going to have one inventory for product one, one inventory for component B, A, and one component, one inventory for component B, all connected to the assemble. And for the suppliers, I just modeled those as basic nodes because I needed to have an object so that I could connect the inventories to. So I just chose to have a simple, um, the uh, simple, um, um, basic node. So if we go back to our definitions, you can see that for each one, for each inventory element, I specified the material, and then I specified the site object name, and then we have the initial quantity. So because these are location-based uh, materials, there is no initial quantity because the quantity is, is uh, stored in the individual inventories. So I have 10 units of uh, product one at the store, I have 20 units at uh, product one at the factory. And again, the site object that I'm using for the factory is a symbol. Then I have 50 units of component B, also tied to the assemble uh, site object, 100 units of uh, component A. Then at the suppliers, I have component A at supplier A, 500 units, component B at supplier B, uh, 250 units. For our processes, let's start with the store. And so what we have is we have a source that just creates a default entity. I'm using a random inner arrival time. 
and then that uh, entity goes to the uh, purchase server. And so this is a task sequence with a, sim a single row. And the single task is to consume, or I call the, that when I'm the task buy here. And so we are uh, we are uh, have a material requirement for product one, and for the it, when I have to say in the task uh, where I'm going to consume it from or the, or produce it to, as we'll see, I specify the inventory site type. So the site that I want to do is the parent object because this is a task associated with the server, and the server is the site object for the um, uh, for the inventory. So I can just consume uh, the material from the parent object. And then we just delete the uh, entity. I have a couple of status uh, labels here. So one is the uh, product one in the store. So this is quantity and stock of product one. And then I also have the um, uh, input buffer contents here for um, uh, for purchase. And so if I step into the model, you can see that there's our starting inventory level here. And if I just run for a little while, I have this uh, speed set to five. So it's pretty fast. You can see that the inventory is going down. When the inventory gets to zero, entities are going to be blocked with the material constraints. So now you can see why I have the status label here. And so we don't have any of the replenishment set up yet. So once we consume all of that initial inventory, any arriving customers to that want to uh, purchase the product uh, are just waiting uh, and um, uh, are waiting at the, the, well, the first one's waiting at the server and the remaining ones are waiting in the input buffer because the server has uh, capacity one. So moving up, let's now look at the factory. And so we can see we have a source, we have an assemble, and we have a sync object. We also have a produce button, which I'm going to describe here in just a second. Before I do that, though, I want to add a, um, a, a status plot so that we can look at the inventory more closely here uh, at the factory. So I'm going to just add my status plot here. Let's just draw it here. I'm going to guess that tech scale. Let's try 0.5. Looks pretty reasonable. And we're going to call this product one at factory. And I'm interested in plotting two things, the quantity in stock and the quantity backordered. So I'm just going to go over here to my additional expressions. And I'm going to have this be uh, product one factory quantity in stock. And so we'll just label this in stock. And then we'll add the same thing, except this time we'll do quantity backordered. So it's still product one, factory, quantity backordered. And we will just name this backordered. So this is going to let me watch the inventory over uh, simulated time. The other thing that we have here uh, is we have a floor label. And so where I used a status label here, because I was really only interested in that product one inventory, we have three separate inventories here. So rather than using three different status label, I just chose to use uh, a floor label. And note with the floor label, we can specify a Simio expression using braces. So I have that component A factory quantity in stock, component B factory quantity in stock, component one, um, uh, I'm sorry, product one, factory, quantity, and stock. And all of those are in braces. And, and so Simio will replace those with the value of the expression as the model runs. And that's why we see uh, we see zeros here. And so again, if I were to just step into the model, we see that those immediately go to their initial values of 150 uh, and 20. And so how we have the factory set up is we have a source. And note that our source is an on-event arrival mode. So when an event occurs we generate uh, uh, the, uh, the default entities. And we're gonna generate the entities per arrival using a model state. So go back over to make sure I'm on model here, definitions, states. I have a model state defined as production batch size. And so that has an initial state value of 10. And so what happens when this source is uh, is uh, initialized, in other words, when the event occurs, then it's going to produce, in this case, 10. So it's going to, as soon as the event occurs, it's going to immediately uh, produce 10, um, uh, 10 instances of default or 10 uh, realizations of default entity. Okay, and so this event that we define, go back to definitions, we have an event here called produce. 
and that's the event that triggers the uh, that triggers the source. I also have a produce button over here, and so if you haven't seen buttons before, it's an animation uh, component here. Look in the animation ribbon, and what it does is it just execute it just fires the event. So when I click this button, it fires the event. And so uh, uh, when we run the model, which I'll do here in just a second, whenever we click on this button, it's going to uh, trigger the source. And so it will, it will create a production batch. The production batch, uh, each one of the production elements or items goes into the assemble step. And we have two rows in our task sequence. We first get the components. And so we consume, and the consumption type here is bill of materials, because remember to produce product one, we need two units of, of product A, and one unit, I'm sorry, of component A, and one unit of component B, that's defined in the bill of materials associated with product one. So I can simply say, I wanna consume that bill of materials uh, for each one. And then we're also gonna use the site inventory type of uh, parent object, because again, this is inside the task sequence. Also note that when I look at the required quantity, we have a quantity of one because what we generate at the source is one default entity for each product one in our batch. So rather than producing 10, I'm going to produce 10, I'm going to create 10 default entity and then each one corresponds to that single uh, unit. And so the net effect is that we will have, we will produce uh, 10 different um, uh, product one. And the actual production of the material happens in step um, in task 20. So we have these two sequential tasks, one where I just require the bill of materials and consume them. And then the second one is where I actually produce the material. So here again, the required quantity is one and we are producing to the parent object. But the difference here is the production type is material. Whereas in the previous step, we were consuming all of the bill of materials, so the component materials, but we are then producing uh, the product itself. And then they just uh, go into the sink. So again, if we execute our model, if we run our model, you can see the store process going on as we saw earlier. And nothing's happening here at the factory because this source is triggered by the event. So there we can see our inventory stock in hand, our quantity in hand, and our quantity back ordered. As soon as I click on produce, we now grab the uh, units. So we uh, are producing 10 component A, and I'm sorry, we're producing 10 product one. So we went from 20 to 30, jumped up in inventory there. And so then when we produce again, uh, and so on. And so if we keep producing, if you can see here, we're gonna eventually run out of component A and component B probably on the next one, so there we are. So now we're at zero component A and component B, and so when I produce, it simply blocks. I'm still producing 10 of the uh, uh, default entities at the source, but now they're all coming to the assemble and we don't have any more component A or component B uh, in inventory. And so they, uh, it, it, it in essence blocks the system at this stage. And finally, we have our two suppliers which are just basic nodes. There's been, I, I made no changes whatsoever. So we have supplier A and supplier B, and their only purpose here, at least in this version of the model, is to provide that site object for, for the corresponding inventory. So there's my inventory level at uh, component A at supplier, and then there's my inventory level component B at supplier. And so once again, when I step into the model, we just it just gets initialized with those initial inventory uh, levels. And so that's our basic starting model. And so note again, when I execute this model, when I run it as it is, I essentially have two different independent subsystems. I have the store where I have customers coming in and consuming, and then they get blocked when we run out of inventory. And then I have the factory, which I can trigger to produce uh, by executing uh, or by firing this, the, the specified event. But these two uh, don't, um, uh, don't interact at all. So again, that's our starting model that we're gonna to use to implement the replenishment policies. And so I strongly suggest that you stop the video now and make sure that you can recreate this model because we're the next step in the video is we're gonna go back in and um, implement the replenishment policies. So we'll do some really simple replenishment policies here uh, from the uh, uh, factory to the store. We're gonna have continuous view, continuous review reorder point, reorder quantity, with the reorder point at zero and the reorder quantity at 10. From the assemble a section of the factory to the factory product inventory, we'll again have continuous view, 
uh, continuous review with reorder point, reorder quantity. This time our reorder point will be 10 and our reorder quantity will also be 10. And then from the suppliers to the factory of the components, uh, continuous review, again, reorder point, reorder quantity, uh, supplier A, which is component A, uh, reorder point of 50 and a reorder quantity of 100, uh, supplier B to the factory, component B, uh, reorder point 10, at uh, reorder quantity 40. And these don't really mean much. These numbers don't really mean much. I just wanted to implement something, and you will see in the for further learning section here, uh, I suggest that you go in and, and, and make some changes to the model so that you can investigate um, uh, different policies. All right, so let's have a look at this very first replenishment. And as I implement these policies, I'm going to do these one at a time. And I'm going to implement them in the model, and I'm going to execute the model and make sure that the model is working as I expect. Because what I try to not do is implement too many changes to the model without going through a, a, a verification testing phase. Otherwise, I have to go back in and test everything at once. So I try to do it in a step-by-step -step, uh, fashion. Okay, here we are back in the model, and the first policy that we're going to implement is the product one inventory at a symbol to the product one inventory at the store, or at the purchase site object. So I'm going to go back in my definitions and go up to elements, and the uh, element I'm interested in, the inventory element, is product one at store. And so I'm going to go over to its review period and say, I want to make this continuous review and then I set the policy at reorder point, reorder quantity. And we said that our policy was going to be 0, 10. So I'll just leave that at 0 and set that at 10. And note that if we don't do the replenishment process, which I'm going to come back and do in just a second, nothing happens, right? So when I execute the model, that replenishment policy is not getting implemented. So while the policy itself is defined as reorder point, reorder quantity with the corresponding component uh, the corresponding parameters of 0 and 10 we're not we're not executing that uh, replenishment policy yet because the actual execution of that policy happens with a replenishment uh, order process and so this is one of the uh, 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 errors that I see when people first start working with inventory elements is they assume that that policy is going to be implemented uh, without doing the process, and it doesn't do that because there's logic associated with the replenishment process that Simio can't infer. It knows about the parameters, 0 as the reorder point and 10 as reorder quantity. And so as you'll see, this uh, process gets executed when it reaches 0, and we have the information on the reorder uh, quantity and the material that's to be uh, used and so on. Uh, but it doesn't actually implement that because we have to know what we're doing, right? And so what we want to do here is I want to uh, consume inventory from the factory and then produce inventory to the store. So there are two steps here. And note, depending on how you have Simeo set up, consume and produce might not be in the common step. So we can just go to the all steps. And the first thing I'm going to do here is just right-click on consume and say show this in common steps and then go right click on produce and say show this in common steps. And so now when I go to my common steps, they're, they're both there. So here's my consume. So the first thing I wanna do is I want to consume inventory and I wanna consume the inventory from the um, um, uh, factory. So I'm gonna consume the material. The material name is uh, component, I'm sorry, product one. The inventory site is a specific object because we are here at the at the store and we don't have a direct connection either through parent or associated object. So we have to say a specific object. And we'll just go and say the product name, uh, I'm sorry, the site object name is a symbol. So we've now said I want to consume the inventory at a symbol. And then the quantity, remember, is token material order detail. And so this information is is uh, is um, uh, constructed by the policy. So the policy sets this quantity, and now that's where we're extracting that information. So we're not going to have any kind of lead time delays or anything here. We're just going to consume from one and produce to the other. So I'm going to go back in and grab my produce step. And now my produce, the material here, is the uh, product one. And our inventory site object here is associated object. I'm going to come back to that in just a second, but let me go ahead and fill in the quantity. Token 
material order detail quantity. Okay, so once again, let's look at this associated object because this is often a source of confusion. So remember when I had the uh, uh, task sequence here uh, where I'm purchasing, right? And I look at that, I'm consuming from the parent object. And it's the parent object because the task sequence is defined in the server. And so the server object instance is its parent. However, the inventory uh, process the, the, the on replenishment process, its associated object is the site object. Okay, so that's why we're going to have, we produce, in this case, we consume in the task from the parent object, but we produce in this add-on process uh, to the associated object. So let's have a closer look at that here before we execute the model. Well, actually, let's execute the model first, and then we'll come back and have a closer look at that. So now when we execute the model, uh, we should be replenishing when we get down to zero. That's our policy. And so you can see that we grab 20, we grab 10 uh, items from this, from the product one inventory at a symbol, and those were then added to the uh, uh, store inventory. So we consume from uh, the factory and we produce to the store. And now we don't have any more product one at, at its inventory. So now we're going to see that we run out. So we get here. And now the red line here of our back order has increased up to 10. So we have back ordered 10. So we have one replenishment process, but we have no inventory uh, to replenish. So the back order continues, or, or uh, we see that we have that back ordered inventory. And then the corresponding entities at the, um, at the store are blocked because there's no inventory. So we'll fix that problem in a second where we will replenish the product one inventory from the assemble process. But for now, let's go back and look at how uh, we can, uh, you know, I mentioned before that this causes confusion about where you're producing, uh, producing to and consuming from. So I want to show one way that we can investigate this further. When you're building the model, sometimes, or a lot of times actually, in the you have to go through a debugging process uh, in order to figure out, in this case, whether you're talking about the associated object or the parent object or the context object associated uh, with the token. So let's go to the consume step and set a breakpoint. And so what's going to happen here is when I run on the first, imp the first execution of this process, uh, when we try to replenish the inventory, the model's going to stop at that breakpoint. So we run the model. Let's just run. Let it run for a second. When that gets down to zero, we'll see it stop. There we go. And it stopped right here. You look down here in the lower left, and you can see that it stopped at a breakpoint. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back to Project Home and turn on the watch window. And I haven't highlighted anything to watch yet, because what I'm really interested in here is the model. So I'm just going to expand the model here. And when I do that, again, you can see all of the, the, the uh, material elements and the uh, inventory elements. And so if I you know, go look here, I can see that the quantity in stock and quantity on order and so on for all of the elements. What I'm particularly interested in is down here, these processes. And it says well, there's one token in process. And of course, that token is executing the, the process where we have the breakpoint. So that's our replenishment process. So I can jump into that, and there is our token. And if we look at our token, token two, we can see it's associated object uh, and functions, right? Let me just grab the functions here. It's associated object is purchase. And so that's why I produce to the associated object because I'm producing the inventory uh, here. That's how I know it's the, the associated object rather than the context object or uh, the parent object. We can also see that material order detail. So remember when you implement the replenishment policy, Simeo is going to fill in that material order detail. And so you can see that here. The material is product one. We don't have inventories defined uh, as part of the policy. Uh, but we have the, um, the uh, uh, I'm sorry, we have the destination inventory. We don't have the source inventory. The destination inventory is product one store, right? So you can see that it has determined from that, uh, that uh, 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 produce step where it's producing to. And then we have a quantity of 10. So this information, so that's why we did uh, token.materialorderdetail.quantity when we specified 
uh, when we specified that quantity. So using the watch window is a really easy way or a really convenient way to be able to uh, go see what's going on. And just remember when you're doing this, if you want to jump inside a process that's executing at the model level, like this one is, you can access that by setting the watch to uh, the model itself, not to a particular uh, object instance uh, in the model. Now that we're satisfied with the replenishment from the factory to the store, let's uh, focus on the replenishment that happens in the factory itself. So we have an inventory of finished goods, and when that inventory reaches its reorder point, we want to order, uh, in this case, uh, the manufacturing process for our production batch size. So remember, we have source one, it produces production batch size uh, number of uh, entities, and then they go to assemble. Uh, where they consume the corresponding component inventory and produce the corresponding uh, finished goods inventory. So let me stop the model here. And so what we need to do is we need to, when we implement the reorder point, when we implement the policy, we need to assign the quantity to this production batch size state and then fire this event, right? So remember when we click the button, it fires the event that produced. So we need to implement that logic, but inside the uh, replenishment process. So let's go back to our definitions. And now I'm interested in product one at factory. And I want that to be continuous review, reorder point, reorder quantity. We said this was gonna be 10, 10. So when it reaches 10, we're going to produce 10. And then we need to specify the process because remember, if I don't specify the production process, Simeo doesn't know how to implement that policy. So I'm going to just double click here. And of course, the first thing I need to do is assign that state variable. So the state variable that we had was production batch size, right? That's a model state. So go back to my definitions. That's our model state that defines how many uh, uh, entities to create whenever I fire that event. So that's the first step that we're going to do. And then I need to fire the event. So go for a fire. And the event that we're going to fire is produce. And well, I never assigned the value. I have production batch size. And so we're going to use token material order detail quantity. So in this case, I set the default value for token, um, I'm sorry, to the production batch quantity to 10, and a replenishment policy just happens to be 10. But in the general case, if I change that policy to say, let's replenish 20, this assign step is going to uh, make that happen. So now we have the assign step, uh, and we have uh, uh, we fire the event. And so we go back, and now when product one inventory gets to 10, we should see the uh, source create the corresponding batch size and so on. So let's watch that and see. So it comes down. When the store gets to zero, it's going to replenish. And so you can see now that our inventory is going back up through that production process. And so now we have these two, uh, the, uh, uh, two inventories tied together through two different replenishment processes. We have the replenishment process at the store, which grabs product one uh, from the factory and, and sends it to the store. Then we have the replenishment project product replenishment process at the factory where we actually produce. Now, of course, when we run out of inventory of component A and component B, we're still going to have the same problem where uh, the model stops because there's no available inventory. Again, we will deal with that problem here in just a second. So there we are. We have no more component A and B. We still have 20 product ones. And now you can see we're down to that reorder point. So there are the, the items that uh, are, are waiting to be assembled. Of course, we don't have any more raw materials. We still do have 10 units here. So we get this one last replenishment, um, uh, the one last replenishment to the, uh, to the store. But as we see, when that goes to zero, now we have a back order there. And if we had the component inventories for A and B, we would see that those are, um, uh, well, they're at zero level. We haven't actually put the replenishment policies in place there. Uh, but we'll do that. Uh, we will do that next. Next, we'll focus on the replenishment policies for our components at the factory. So we're going to replenish component A from supplier A and replenish component B from supplier B. So let's go back to our definitions and elements. And we have component A at the factory. And we want continuous review, 
uh, reorder point, reorder quantity. And what did we say for this one? He said 50, uh, 50 and 100. Yep, so reorder point of 50, reorder quantity of 100. And we'll go ahead and uh, trigger that process. And so we're going to, in this case, consume from the supplier and produce to the, um, to the uh, um, uh, uh, factory. So I'm just going to copy these steps here. So I'm just going to uh, control C and control V here, consume. Of course, we're consuming not a product one anymore. We're consuming component A. The specific object that we're consuming from now is supplier A. So we're consuming component A from the specific object supplier A. Material order, uh, token material order detail quantity specifies uh, that quantity. Next, we'll produce. So we just produce that to our current inventory. Again, it's not product one anymore. It's component A, and we want the inventory site object that we produce it to can just be the associated object, because in this case we have uh, we are uh, uh, doing the the uh, inventory policy replenishment policy for the factory for component A at the factory. So if we then go execute that and make sure this is going to work, so it's going to take it a little a little while to. Uh, uh, to run. Let's see if we get that. Well, actually, I can increase the speed a bit. Let's increase it to 10. We're going to see this run out here. When component A runs out, we should see that replenishment happen. It's going to take a little while to do that, of course. And so note, I'll just comment while we're waiting for this to happen, is that we have very, very simplistic replenishment policies here, right? We haven't implemented any kind of delay uh, or anything. We've simply... <laughs> Why are we not getting any replenishment here? Component A, replenish. All right, hold on a second. Let's go back and check our policy. So component A at the factory. Yep, component A, assemble, continuous, reorder point, reorder quantity. Go to our process, consume from the supplier, produce, oop, I have the wrong material name. So I'm producing component B, even though I consume component A. And so let's go back, fix that now, it's component A, and we'll let it run for a little while. We can increase the speed, since I've already talked about the static, uh, the simplicity of the policy. Let that run. When this gets to 50 now, we should see it increase. There we go. It jumped up to 140 as soon as it, um, as soon as it got down to 50. Okay, so we're going to stop here, and let me set that back down to 10, and then finally go and do the replenishment for component B. So we go to our definitions, see if I can get this one right this time. So this is component B at the factory, and we want continuous review, reorder point, reorder quantity, and this one we said 10 and 40, so we're going to replenish more frequently. Replenishment quantity 40, and we have its on replenishment process. Here as before, I'm just going to copy and paste. Of course, that's probably what got me in trouble before. So we're going to consume component B from supplier B, right there. So component B from supplier B, material order uh, detail. So there, grab the produce right there. And now it's again, component B. See if I get this one right this time. There we go. So now we have its, it's um, uh, replenishment process for component B. So now when we run, we should see both A and B uh, being replenished. A should happen pretty quickly. Um, I'm sorry, B should happen pretty quickly. That component B is not, doesn't look like it's replenishing. We had, oh, we had 1040. That's right, 10 and 40. So it hasn't gotten to the replenishment part yet. There we go. It jumped immediately back up to 50. So now you can see our store is being replenished from our uh, finished goods inventory at the factory. Our finished goods inventory fact at the factory is replenished from the manufacturing process. The raw material inventory is being replenished uh, from our two suppliers. So now we have this completely uh, connected supply chain. You can see our inventory, you know, spiking with uh, um, yeah, consumption from the replenishment process and then manufacturing and consumption and manufacturing uh, and so on. And if we had the equivalent plots for the inventories at the store or the inventories at the supplier, we would see the same uh, basic um, uh, 
uh, same basic structure of consumption and replenish and consumption and replenish. Of course, once the two supplier inventories get to zero, then the, the system will eventually stop when we can no longer replenish the inventory uh, at the store. If we have no control over our supplier, uh, we can fix that problem by just going into component A at supplier and then setting the assume infinite inventory if and just set that one to one. And if we do that for B, uh, for B also at uh, supplier B, now the system would would would, uh, would not stop until the, the ending time uh, happens because we're consuming, but we're replenishing all of our inventories. And when these two inventories get down to zero, because we have that assume infinite policy, those inventory levels would just go negative, but we would meet the uh, consumption, the uh, replenishment policy uh, specified in the process. So as I mentioned uh, before, we have very simplistic replenishment policies. In other words, we have no lead times or anything. We basically consume from one inventory and we instantaneously produce at the destination inventory. And so in any reasonable system, the store and the factory would likely have a lead time for the products to get there. Similarly, the uh, material from the inventory, I'm sorry, from the supplier would almost certainly have a lead time. And so those inventory lead time delays could just be uh, simulated by introducing logic here between the consume and the produce. So we consume so that we allocate the inventory and then we delay or have some other type of submission uh, uh, delivery process uh, so that we can uh, implement or model that uh, lead time delay. And then we produce, which would be, you know, uh, uh, equivalent to the order arriving, if you want to think about it that way. So again, we did a simple one. Uh, you should, if you haven't been following along on your own to the model, you should definitely stop the model and make sure that you can uh, create the model. And once that happens, for further learning and practice, uh, you should consider the following uh, uh, things and, and actually try some of these. So first of all, as I already mentioned, incorporate lead time delays. And when you do that, you will see that the replenishment policies will, all, will also need to be adjusted. So we had some of our inventory repl replenishment policies, the reorder point at zero. And so if there's a lead time delay, then you're going to want to make those um, you know, uh, increase those values, or you're going to block when the replenishment um, is needed prior to the delivery. Uh, and you can just adjust those and see what the impact is. And then secondly, uh, incorporate production process for component A at supplier A. So supplier A and B, we just assume we could order, but we could introduce another uh, production process at, at um at, at uh, supplier A. And so I suggest using three subcomponents, sub A1, sub A2, sub A3. Of course, I've given you the, the uh, bill of materials here. And then you assume that each one of these is also uh, supplied from individual suppliers. So basically now what we're doing is we're saying we have two production processes. So you can think of number two as if the company that owns the factory, say purchase supplier A. So now the manufacturing process that happens at supplier A is part of the supply chain. And so we are then implementing that production logic for A, uh, for supplier A. And then a, a third modification is uh, suppose that you identify a second supplier for component B, uh, but the components are more expensive. And so what we want to do is use the second newly identified supplier only if the current supplier, supplier B, doesn't have any units in stock. So we're going to assume that we have visibility into their inventory level. And based on that level, we're going to use a decision process within the replenishment, uh, the, the uh, process itself, uh, to choose whether or not to use the more expensive supplier. I'm not going to ask you to turn any of these in, so this is just something you should study on your own. But as usual, I'm more than happy to answer any questions that you might have uh, on implementing any of these changes.